This is the Aptitude Outdoors podcast. sat down sure as hell whatever this thing is starts i can hear it start working its way down the hill kind of going back and forth closer to me and i'm sitting there thinking all right this is it and it's waited until we got as close as i could it sounded like it was as close as it and i just jumped up and i sprinted up the hill towards the sound with my camera and there was nothing. in the moment what i thought was a big cat stalking me out of the woods and then as it got down to just before seeing it thinking it was a person because of hearing the actual footfalls and then when i finally did stand up at first i didn't see it and then all of a sudden what the heck is that thinking it was a black bear because it squatted down and then when it stood up it stood and turned and looked in my direction i saw the gear at the side of its head and the flat face side profile and it turned and looked at me and uh seeing it in broad daylight was absolutely the most amazing experience you could ever have all right, Emily, welcome to the podcast, and uh, I'm glad that you, you're, you're able to take time out and come talk to me. Uh, I know we have a lot of few, uh, mutual friends in common and stuff, so it's about time we, we get on the podcast together, uh, and I, I enjoy the work you do with the Forest Fleur and all this cool stuff you're always doing research. Uh, before we dive into you know all the, the fun Bigfoot topics that we all love so much, uh, how did you get started? Because my backstory is... You know, I'm always on Instagram. You probably mm-hmm. guys all get annoyed with me. I post like every day, nonstop. <laughs> and uh, I saw your page when I was looking up Bigfoot stuff and I followed you guys and you guys, you're always putting out cool stuff. So how did you get initially interested in in Bigfoot? Yeah, um, thank you. First of all, um, I yeah. try really hard to just create stuff that's really authentic and, you know, that appeals to a large audience. I want people to be able to learn about Bigfoot in a way that's really easy to understand. Um, I first started out, I watched a documentary when I was really young, and it was The Legend of Bigfoot by Ivan Marks. And, you know, it's super cheesy. We all know Ivan Marks is a hoaxer. Uh, but for, you know, for some reason, it just kind of struck a chord within me. And I was, it just excited me. You know, if, if there's one thing that you can say about Ivan Marks, it's that he has the passion and he has the enthusiasm. So I was really inspired by this documentary. And so my I begged my family, can we go somewhere where there's a lot of Bigfoot sightings? Can we go on vacation and, and try and find Bigfoot? And so I was I was probably like 12 or 13 at the time. We took a trip up to Whitehall, New York, and that is just the mecca of New York Bigfoot. There's a big statue in the middle of the town. There's a museum. Uh, it's not a Bigfoot museum, but a lot of the museum curators were telling me stories about Bigfoot. Um, there was a famous sighting by law enforcement as well as a sighting on a local golf course. So there's just a lot of rich history of Bigfoot in this area. And as soon as I went there, I was so inspired. They had these little wooden carvings in the glass showcase at the museum that was made by, you know, just a local townsman. And they were they were carvings of Bigfoot and they were ten dollars. So my family was like, okay, well, we have to get one. There were only like five or six of them in the case and they're since gone. Um, And as I took that home, I started thinking to myself, you know, I am really inspired by this whole experience. The the local museum curator took out a map and he showed me all of the areas where Bigfoot may roam. He showed me the cave systems in Vermont where they may be traveling through and seeking shelter and taking home this souvenir just really brought together the entire experience. So later when I got to college, I went to school for product development and we had an assignment. My professor said, you know, take a business model, make a whole business model and make it unique. Everybody in my school, I went to the Fashion Institute of Technology. So everyone was doing things on clothing or accessories, handbags, totally not my thing. Like I'm an (laughs) outdoors girl. Um, So I said, let me try and do something 
related to Bigfoot. And I had remembered how this simple souvenir had given me so much purpose and and so much ambition to begin researching into this subject. So I thought, what better way to inspire people to look for Bigfoot than to come up with a business model where I'm you know, running a research organization and also creating souvenirs so that when people take home a souvenir, it inspires them to keep going every day to look for Bigfoot. You know, it's not just something that sits on a shelf. It's something that you look at and you say, you know what, I can go out in the field this weekend. I can do this. I can find evidence. So that's kind of how it all started. And um, it's grown significantly since then. Um, it started off as me just, you know, making products in my basement and doing simple research in, you know, Jeff Meldrum's book uh, to now I'm doing a lot more research. I'm making a lot more products, but I'm especially now focusing on on field work and, you know, searching for evidence of this creature. So it's it's been quite a journey and um, it's just been so much fun so far. So that that's how I got started. Awesome. And yeah, it, it's surprising when, when I saw your podcast, you know, I, I started following you guys around, I think around when it started, like you'd only yeah. had a few episodes out and the like high profile guests that you guys got on the podcast very quickly is awesome. So congrats on that. Thank um, you. And that it, it's so funny to me because these are people I saw as a kid on TV and, mm-hmm. and in the documentaries, like, like I see these faces all the time and I'm just like, Wow, that is impressive. So, uh, recently, uh, I've saw your face in the uh, the newest documentary from Small Town Monsters. <laughs> uh, so that was really interesting. How was that experience for you? Because they're always putting out documentary after documentary, like nonstop, twenty four seven. So, what was that experience like? Did you get to like research with them at all, or did you get to well, go anywhere? You know, the whole thing is that what inspired me the most to go up to Whitehall, New York. You know, when I first began my journey was was Small Town Monsters, Beast of Whitehall. And I really have always enjoyed their work. I think Seth does a really great job of, you know, what I like the best about him is that he tells the story of the people involved in Bigfoot. And I think that's a really unique perspective because most people just focus on the creature themselves. But by learning about the creature through the people, that study this subject, I think is a really unique approach. So I enjoyed my experience so much. Uh, It was, you know, mid COVID, I was a little bit hesitant to partake in it, but I I talked to Seth, you know, everything was gonna be really safe and facilitated with a lot of guidelines and, you know, following um, all of the guidelines by the government at the time. And so I went remote camping, you know, normally I would, I mean, I do camp, but normally I'd stay in a hotel if I'm going to, you know, have yeah. to be on t- on, on a, in a documentary with my hair looking <laughs> nice and my makeup looking nice. But because of the pandemic, you know, I was remote camping. I got up, you know, all sweaty in the humidity and I got ready. So it was, it was quite an experience, but it was so much fun to talk to Seth and the team. Uh, I got to know them really well. And we just talked about Bigfoot and the local area. And I know Seth um, really, White Hall is a really close place to Seth's heart because he he just really loves the whole culture that surrounds Bigfoot in that area. It really has become the town's identity. So that was really fun partaking in that. And there are um, a hundred other great researchers that are featured all throughout his documentaries, um, but especially in this one. I know Mike from from Tactical Bigfoot Research is is one of my my good friends, and um, you know he he just showcased a lot of really great people. And honestly, it was just an honor to be a part of that and to share my perspective um, on the creature. And uh, since the documentary, I have been inspired to start doing more field work in the Adirondack region. And you know, lucky for me, I, I well, unlucky and lucky, I was laid off from my corporate job uh, because of the pandemic. And so for the past year, I have just been going out every month into the Adirondacks searching for evidence of this creature. And Seth really did inspire me because I thought, wow, you know, somebody cares about what I have to say about Bigfoot, you know, maybe this is an avenue that I can educate people on this subject so that everybody doesn't view it just as this novelty legend. People view it as a real scientific field and a biologic animal. Yeah, and I've noticed that on your episodes, you do a lot of essentially like anthropological interpretations of a lot of things, and and you're trying to get more of like a scientific Mm -hmm. background. So if you could sum up your 
your philosophy on Bigfoot, I guess, or what what your thoughts are on the whole subject, how would you kind of put that into words? So I think that it's really hard for Bigfoot researchers to admit we don't have a lot of evidence about this creature. Uh, We have the footprints. We do have hair samples, none of which have yielded real, you know, DNA that's worthy of investigating further. Uh, But we do have hair samples that show structural differences and unique features that kind of classify them as an unknown species. So that's really all we have in addition to eyewitness reports. And when you're talking about eyewitness reports, you know, you really, you have to be careful about what you believe, right? Because if somebody's telling you something that's false, then you're going to be contributing incorrect data to the databases like the BFRO and, and, you know, others alike. And so I think it's kind of tricky to just go off of that. So what I'm trying to do with the forest floor and, and my research and my podcast is I'm trying to open people's minds to the possibility of Bigfoot and also, you know, making them realize when I, when I tell the average person that I'm a Bigfooter, they think, oh, you're searching for a legend. You're searching for, you know, a cryptid. But, you know, when, in terms of cryptids, cryptids are not really legends. Cryptids are just animals that are, you know, thought to have gone extinct or thought to not exist. Um, But, Bigfoot is a real animal. Bigfoot is a real species. So what I'm trying to do is open people's people's minds by studying the human evolutionary tree and the history of apes as well to see where Bigfoot may fit into the mix. There is a hominin, Australopithecus sediba, and I just published an article on my members page. And this is all about, you know, the similarities between this hominin and Bigfoot, physically, behaviorally, and we look, we don't know much about our, our evolutionary tree. We don't know much about, you know, these, these hominins that belong to our lineage. But if we can try and look at their anatomy and line that up with what we what we observe in Bigfoot reports, then it kind of gives us a good idea of where Bigfoot sits on our family tree. Is it more of an ape? Is it more of a human? That's the ongoing debate. Um, So what I'm up to now is I'm trying to research what it means to be human. Humans are the only species that have advanced in a way that we manipulate our environment to suit us instead of conforming to the environment, right? So, you know, you look at a gorilla, a gorilla makes a nest. A gorilla, you know, looks for certain resources because of the way its environment is. But humans, we didn't like that, right? We wanted to, we wanted to make our lives easier. So we invented farming. Um, You know, we invented irrigation systems, domestication of animals. Um, So what we did was we started manipulating the environment around us to suit our needs, which then gave us free time. And when when a species has free time, that then paves the way for creativity. And humans began developing a more complex language, a culture, music, art. And that is what makes us human. That is what defines us as human. No other species does this. Elephants, highly intelligent species. Dolphins, whales, apparently they feel more emotions than we do. So what I'm trying to do is open people's minds and say, you know, where does Bigfoot fit in on our evolutionary tree? We look at the behavior from eyewitness reports. We look at the anatomy from from footprint casts and we try and piece it together. So what I like to do for my podcast is I like to bring scientists and researchers on to discuss their theories on Bigfoot. Even if I don't agree with someone's theories, Oftentimes it opens up my own mind to say, hmm, you know, I don't agree with that, but maybe that connects to this. And then you just begin forming your own theories and you become a better researcher. So recently I've been trying to get more eyewitnesses on the show um, because I do think that's important as well. Uh, I'm trying to vet them, you know, to make sure that these are credible reports. Mm-hmm. which is not easy. You know, you do kind of have to just trust the person and, and look at their credibility. Uh, but that's what I'm really trying to do with my research organization is just open people's minds and say, if a creature like this existed as Gigantopithecus or Paranthropus and they share similar physical appearances, then why do people write Bigfoot off as just a legend? Yeah, and that's, that's, the, that's the toss-up I have in my mind as well. 
It's very because I I listen to Bigfoot podcasts and I watch all the doc. I've seen like every documentary that is existing online, like that I can find. I'm constantly watching it, uh, and I haven't figured out if it's something I'm just interested in because it's so out there and like mm -hmm. not able to be figured out yet, or is mm -hmm. it something that's just like. People want it to believe it so badly that it's existing. Yeah. And it's mm -hmm. a real toss up because personally, I've spent hundreds and hundreds of nights in the woods. Like, mm -hmm. I'm obsessed. I've been, you know, backpacking hundreds of nights. I've been, you know, I've gone overnight canoeing, kayaking. I've spent nights in the woods up at like 3 a.m. hunting, you know, mm -hmm. hundreds of hours of all of these things. And it's always in the back of your mind. And then nothing ever happens. So it's like, you know, it, you go down these pathways and it's like sometimes you're like, yeah, maybe. I, I don't know. Uh, maybe not. I, so I'm I'm very, I would say, optimistic and skeptical mm -hmm. at the same time because, like, I don't know what to, I don't know what to think. And that's why I love having Bigfoot people who like are into Bigfoot or researchers on my show, because mm -hmm. I don't have anybody else to talk to about, you know, Bigfoot <laughs> at all. And right. And. It's so interesting to me because right here in Ohio, from what I've heard, is like we have an inordinate amount of Bigfoot sightings. I don't mm -hmm. know why. Yes. Um, people in Ohio must either are out there looking more or there's more of the Bigfoot. I'm not mm -hmm. sure. So what – I mean you got to know about that. You're always mm -hmm. researching it too. Why do you think Ohio? Because I don't – I just don't get it. Well, you know, the thing about it is in order for – in a sighting to occur, there has to be a Sasquatch and there has to be a human there at the same time. <laughs> That's true. So, you know, it really is kind of a toss up. It's, it's hard to say. And this is something my team and I have been discussing a lot recently is, you know, is there a cluster of reports in the Pacific Northwest because the people out there really value outdoors and they're always out, you know, outside hiking, hunting, fishing, whatever it is, or is it because there's more Sasquatches in the area or does it have to do with their behavior? Are the Sasquatches in Ohio, you know, a little bit less afraid of humans? You know, you kind of look at deer, you know, there's a lot of places like I know on, on, in New York, on Long Island, out in the Hamptons at the tip of the island, deer will come right up to you and they're not afraid of you at all. So could this be the same thing with Sasquatch? You know, are certain Sasquatches, you know, more inclined to show themselves? I don't know. I mean, it's it's a great question, but I do think that, um, I don't think there's many of them. I think it's probably a smaller species. I don't think there's as many Sasquatch as there are humans. And if there are, then they're definitely living underground or something because we would definitely be seeing them more. Um, but, you know, these creatures dwell in the densest parts of the forest. I do think that it is a situational thing. I think certain areas, the creatures have different behaviors. And perhaps in Ohio, they're just more used to people. Um you know, or maybe they're just more inclined to show themselves. Maybe they're sharing food sources with you guys over there. Um, but it's it's a great question. And I don't think it will be answered until we discover the species. And, and you know, that also speaks to the point, are they all the same species? Are the Sasquatch in British Columbia the same as in Florida? It's another yeah. question that's unanswered. Yeah, I mean, that, that could be very, very well be the case. I mean, there are, the thing that blows my mind is like, how many reports there are. Mm -hmm. And I, it's hard for me sometimes because they also kind of get lumped in with other more like paranormal reports of things. So it's like, right. where do you draw the line with credible? Cause sometimes, I mean, I listen a lot and I hear some of the, some of the like in-person reports I hear, I'm just like, this is not, there's no way that this person's not insane. Mm -hmm. so like, and some of them you're like, I don't know. That could be me. Like, this guy seems pretty normal. Like, he yeah. doesn't seem like he's full of shit, basically. And you're just right. kind of like, like, so it, the eyewitness report thing is very hard because there's so many accounts. There's thousands and thousands, but it is. N we have zero pick or like compelling evidence, I guess. And it, like, even with Connor talking to Connor, he mm -hmm. was like, the the evidence we have is footprints. The evidence we have is one video, basically from yes. the '60s or the '70s. I'm sorry, I don't I don't remember. So mm -hmm. um, 
It's and but the amount of people looking seems to be going through the roof. Yes. Like the amount of people yes. out there because I can't keep up anymore. I mean, there's just too many shows and yeah. documentaries and and podcasts and you know yeah. there needs to be a summit of of the ho- most highly skilled. And you you've you've talked to some of the people from um oh my gosh, I can't I just forgot it. The name they're the big research organization that owns that property or whatever out in there in the um area oh, X. Uh, oh, okay. Okay. So we have the North American Wood Ape yeah, that Conservancy. One. Yep. And then the Olympic Project. There's a few, a few different groups. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I think that's a great point. You know, we, we do have a lot of people out there looking for them, but does that make them more elusive? There's another question, you know, if there's more people out there trying to find them, they may just start adapting and becoming more elusive. It's, it's, but, you know, going back to your point about evidence, um, I try and keep eyewitness reports on the back burner. I try and keep them in mind. I do listen to podcasts like Sasquatch Chronicles, where they talk about eyewitness reports. Uh, I, I take eyewitness reports. A lot of people contact me on social media and tell me their stories. And I do think it's really important to listen because that's how this whole phenomenon started. Um, but I tend to focus more on the philosophy behind Bigfoot. It's not necessarily the science because, you know, I just spoke with researcher Tom Powell and he's got a lot of crazy theories and, you know, a lot of um, theories that kind of morph the paranormal and the unknown with Bigfoot. And I don't agree with a lot of what he says, but I respect him as a researcher. And something that I really enjoyed that he said on my podcast episode was, we as researchers are not scientists. We're more like spies, right? Like, the the military intelligence didn't find Osama bin Laden using science and a hypothesis. They found him using intelligence. And I thought that was a really interesting point because we're trying to do just that. We're gathering intelligence on this creature. And although eyewitness reports are very helpful in that process, Evidence like the footprint cast and the Patterson-Gimlin film are typically what I like to focus on. The Patterson-Gimlin film has been analyzed using optic measuring, um, you know, the footprints that went along with the film. It, it all lines up that this cannot be a person in a suit. And when you really break down the anatomy of a Sasquatch, it really cannot be replicated by a human. The way that this thing walks, and if you look at any video of a Sasquatch, you can pretty much tell if it's real or not, depending on how the creature bends its back trailing leg. If it's bent at almost a right angle, then that's not able to be recreated by a human. Even if a human is wearing clown shoes, even if a human is wearing a suit with some kind of apparatus, there just is no way that we can lift our foot at that angle, our leg at that angle, because of our the anatomy of our feet. It's completely different. So when you look at that and you piece those things together, I think that we come up with some really credible evidence. And although the eyewitness reports help, I like to focus more on the science behind it and then kind of branch off our evolutionary tree and see where that kind of fits in. But, you know, I mean, the eyewitness reports are incredibly important as well, because then you get physical descriptions and that's what's really important. Also, there's a phenomenon where people see these things more than once. You know, a Mm -hmm. lot of people who have one encounter have three or four encounters. And I'm thinking to myself, this person's BSing me. Like there's no Mm -hmm. way that they're seeing Sasquatch four times and I'm out there looking for it and haven't even seen it (laughs) once. But, you know, when you think about it, you know, you've seen deer before. So now when you're in the woods, you know what you're looking for. You know how tall a deer is. You know what color a deer is. You know where a deer might be. If you see a Sasquatch once, maybe you you are more inclined to see it again because you know what level of the forest to look and you know where it may be hiding. That's the only, re- you know, the only thing I can come up with really, the only explanation for that. Yeah, and it is it is difficult in the woods, especially to pick anything out. I mean, I live right here in Northwest Ohio. I mean, we have right up the road, there's like a few thousand acre preserve. I'm there all the time. I mean, I've hiked probably damn near every inch of that thing. And, you know, I've only seen a raccoon maybe once, twice, but they're everywhere. I see, they come up to my back door more than I see them in the woods or deer. You know, I've seen deer out there 10 times and I've probably been there a hundred, you know, it's just like, you know, I I get what you're saying. Uh, Mm -hmm. Personally, is there any any evidence 
that you've experienced personally that you that like made you like yes I 100% believe this right now um I have found evidence I wouldn't say that it was like a defining moment for me because at that point after all the research I had done on the Patterson Gimlin film and the footprints I already was convinced that these creatures existed but I did have an incident it was um I believe it was 2017 I went up to Lake George and I was just there for a casual trip. I was not big footing. I was starting to get into Bigfoot. This is around the time when I started my Instagram, started my research organization, but it was nowhere near. Uh, like I was not putting as much time in it, in it as I am now. Um, so I was just going up there for fun. And while I was on trail, I said to the, to the person that was with me, I said, let's start making some calls and just practice and see if, you know, see if we can outdo each other. Like we weren't even thinking, let's see if we can get a response. We were just Mm -hmm. kind of saying, there's nobody on this trail. Let's start practicing. And this was before the busy season. There's barely anybody up there at that time. So we started calling and, you know, about a couple minutes later, I start hearing a response and this call was going on for about 15 minutes straight and it would just scream and stop and scream and stop. And the best way I could describe it is it was loud, but, and it was powerful, but it was far away and it was getting closer. It seemed to be getting closer. So that was kind of a pretty spooky moment for me. And I did get it on recording. It's not a very good recording because it was on my cell phone at the time. I have since upgraded my technology. <laughs> um, but it was it was a very interesting experience because I wasn't out there looking for Bigfoot. I, I just happened to stumble upon something that was very strange. And of course, I didn't see what made the vocalization. So I can't say for sure. But it did to me, I mean, I would say it was likely that it was a Sasquatch only because what else could it have been? There's nobody in that area at that time of year. Um, And so then uh, this past November, I was doing research in Vermont around the Fairhaven area. And I came across a footprint in the mud and it had what looked to be clear toes. Uh, It wasn't that large. I would say it, it, to me, it seemed like it may have come from a juvenile or maybe half the print was just cut off. It may have been a half cast. But when I found that footprint, I was pretty blown away. And I said, wow, you know, that's what convinced me that they could be up in that area. Yeah. And you you said you've been doing some research up in the Adirondacks and yes. having only been there one time, you know, recently <laughs> in, in the wintertime, uh, it is vast, if you want to put it lightly, to describe mm-hmm. the Adirondacks. I mean, I got, I believe it was Mount Joe. I went up the first day I was there because it's an easy little entry level hike. And, you know, mm-hmm. was, I live in Ohio. We do not have mountains. So anything right. with elevation just kills me. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> me and, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so I go up there and I look and I'm, I'm with James, who's been on your podcast. And, I, mm-hmm. he, and he's like, this is the Adirondacks. And I'm like, this is this. It just goes forever. It just never yeah. ends. It's just yeah. wilderness forest. So yeah, I mean, how do you even start? Like when you, when you say I'm going to go out and do field research, how do you pick an area? Are you just going off witness like, like reports? Or are you just kind of like looking at maps and saying, if I were this thing, this is where Mm -hmm. I'd be. So what's your, I would yeah. say I would say a little bit of both. Um, I used to just go by reports, uh, but then I talked to researcher Matt Pruitt, um, and he explained to me that it's probably better to just look for habitat. And I know that Shane Corson had said something similar to me, so I thought, you know, that's a really interesting perspective on it. Um, so I started looking more at the habitat and less at the reports. Now, the other thing that I did was every month of this past year, this pandemic year, this horrible year, um, (laughs) I would do camping uh, in a different part of the Adirondacks. So I tried out the Wells, New York area. I tried out Lake George area, Whitehall area, Vermont. And I tried different things just to kind of get an idea of which habitat was kind of calling me there. You know, And, and I think a lot of this is just you know, um, taking a look at the population of people in relation to the amount of space. So I had talked to James about a couple of reports that that came out of the Wells, New York area. That's a place, it's very run down. There's not a lot of houses there. You know, these are like ca- you know, little run down cabins along the Sacandaga River. And I thought, you know what? This might be a good place because there's not a lot of people. It is not a tourist area. 
they might be here. Mm -hmm. So it all depends on the time of year too. You know, in November, I was in the Lake George area, the Whitehall area and the Vermont area. Now, typically in July, those areas are booming with people all over the trails. These people are, you know, tons of tourists, but on the off season, maybe a Sasquatch is passing through. And sure enough, I found a footprint. But when it comes to like the July, August months, I wanted to spend more time in the Wells, New York area because there's less tourists there. So okay. I guess I'm just trying to think like if I was trying to remain elusive and don't get me wrong, I don't think that Sasquatch, you know, come together as a group and say, let's avoid people. I think they just try and avoid anything that seems like a threat. So in my eyes, I would be staying away from the main trails, the main campgrounds and the tourists. And so by season, I try and figure out, you know, where they might be. But again, it's it's very difficult to predict their movements. And a lot of researchers will say, and I myself have said this in the past, that we see patterns in sightings that may indicate some sort of migratory, you know, migratory pattern or, or path. And I'm starting to feel like that may not be the case anymore because our data is so skewed and it really is not complete. So it's hard to say, you know, it's not like we're going out and we're seeing these creatures in certain places and we're getting video documentation of them. Like we're just going off of people's stories. So I think when it comes to Bigfoot research, it's important to just stay true to yourself, you know, trust your instincts, be smart and look at the resources, look at the habitat rather than the sightings. I think it can definitely, they can go hand in hand, but focus more on the habitat. Yeah. And uh, so a kind of a thing that I, I've, I've, talked about in the past and you know i'm i'm always kind of like in this mindset of like thinking about how if you were if you were going to film this thing how would you do it because i'm always filming i literally have yeah. my camera right here I, mm -hmm. I always i take it everywhere i mean I, mm -hmm. I was out in cleveland ohio yesterday filming some stuff and doing stuff and i was at the rock and roll hall of fame uh, i just what and you know there's a lot of stuff there to see and i'm taking pictures and an example of kind of like something that I've talked about in the past too is like you pull out a camera and then you see something you want to take a picture of. 90% of the time it's there. You can just kind of take a quick pic of it and be like, okay, cool. That was awesome. It's moving or it's not still, it's moving. Um, and then, you know, I do a lot of wildlife photography where mm -hmm. you have one second to get the right. animal before it's gone. Like a perfect example for me is a pileated woodpecker. They're hmm. damn near impossible to get on wow. camera half the time because as soon as they see you, they're gone. They're off. Yeah. You have to have mm -hmm. a huge zoom lens. You have to be very quiet. So I have experience in all these different things. And yesterday I was riding up an escalator, you know, just looking at stuff and I'm looking around. I see something real cool and I pull, I have my camera in my hand. It's on. Mm -hmm. And I look up and I take a picture of it and I'm like, oh, cool. But that angle's gone. That that time is gone. And right. I look at the picture and the settings were all wrong because I just came out of a dark room. It was completely mm -hmm. like had the camera turned way up uh, and I and the picture's like not usable. It's complete garbage. Mm -hmm. So I'm just like thinking if you're out in the woods and you see one of these things, even if you have a camera or your phone, how many times have you pulled your phone out of the pocket after hiking and there's a little sweat on it? You can't open the screen. Yeah. You can't do – and it's just like – so I have a lot of sympathy for people trying to go out and film this stuff because, like, you have one second usually yes. or a few yes. seconds to get an, any animal that are easy to photograph, let alone mm -hmm. uh, a creature that does not want to be around you at all. So, you know, yeah. have you had any experiences or have any of your guests had any experiences where that kind of rings true, where you're just like, shit, I could have had this thing on camera and I had one opportunity and I blew it. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I myself have not had any sightings, um, but I do know a lot of people who have. And for them, what I've heard is not so much that it's, you know, difficult to get the camera out, which, I mean, I agree with you. I think that's a huge factor in it, even if somebody went to take a picture. But in my experience um, interviewing people, most people say that it was the fear and the shock factor that prevented them from even remembering they had a camera with them. And mm -hmm. you have to think about it this way. You know, we see eyewitness sketches of Bigfoot. We see cartoons of Bigfoot. We see Harry and the Hendersons. But when you are out in the wilderness, a place that you spend a lot of time a place that is familiar to you, a place that you think you know all the animals within it, and you all of a sudden see 
a caveman like creature covered in hair. I mean, whether you want to attribute it to a gorilla or a caveman, human like or ape like, that's terrifying. I mean, how would you feel if you were walking through the woods of Ohio and a chimpanzee started walking up to you? Exactly. I mean, it's just terrifying. And these things are way bigger than than we think. Um I think it's important to try and get a perspective on how large they are. And I went to a wildlife museum recently where they had a, um, it was all taxidermy and beautiful work. Um, although, you know, it makes me sad that the animals are, but it's good research. Yeah. So I went up to a grizzly bear. The grizzly bear was standing tall. It was about seven or eight feet tall. And I stood in front of this thing and I looked up and I thought, wow, you know, it really gains you a perspective on how large this animal is. This is a giant. You look at stories from the Native Americans, even stories in the Bible talk about giants. This is not just some ape in the woods. This is a giant. And when you come across something like this in the woods, I don't think your first instinct is going to be, let me take out my phone and take a picture. You're going to want to watch this thing. If it's close enough, you're going to think, oh my God, you know, what if this charges at me? You're going to want to watch its movements. So perhaps if you're far away, you may be able to snap a shot, which many people do, but then it's not a good picture because no matter what quality your phone is for K or not, it's not going to capture a clear image of something, you know, that's hundreds of feet away and moving, right? So, you know, you really need to have a prof professional equipment with you. And, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's tricky. You know, a lot of people say, well, why can't we get them with drones? Well, the, they, they don't walk out in the open very often. They're in tree cover. So it's hard to, to capture them on film that way. And I know that a lot of people try with the trail cameras, but in my experience interviewing people, I've heard that the creatures are, are a little bit smarter than we think we than we think they are, and they avoid the trail cameras. I don't know for what reason, but hey, certain animals are sensitive to that type of stuff. Look at dogs. Dogs hate thunder and lightning. Dogs can hear noises that we can't. I mean, there's apps on your phone that can create a dog whistle and it'll drive your dog nuts. So who's to say that they don't have some kind of ability that way and the trail cameras are bothering them in some sense of energy? I don't know. But um, it just seems like they're a little bit smarter than most people give them credit for. And I think that it's definitely harder to capture them on film than it was, you know, 50 years ago. I mean, you think about even the Patterson-Gimlin film and if you read through John Green's book, John Green has some amazing stories in his book. And there's a lot of stories about prospectors that were out in the woods, came across a colony of Sasquatches and sat down and watched them for like an hour. But that, you know, these people are spending all their time in the woods. Nowadays, most people have full-time jobs. They're spending their free time in the woods. And sure, it may be, it may be a, a large amount of time, but we're not going to areas that are completely unexplored as much as we were back during the 60s and, you know, even earlier than that. I mean, you know, prospectors looking for gold out there, they were in the, the deepest of wilderness. And there, there weren't a lot of people doing that. You know, they were doing this for two, three weeks at a time. So I would imagine if somebody spent you know, a month or two out in the woods, went to the deepest, most remote part of the forest, I bet they would come out with something. Yeah, and I think a lot of people nowadays, I'm going to say this. Yeah, I'm going to say it. Uh, a lot of people nowadays are soft and, like, they can't handle that. I mean, going out in the woods for months at a time is very difficult. Trust me. <laughs> I've yeah. been there. It's it's yeah. very hard. It takes a lot of mental energy. It takes a right. lot of resources. Uh, and we just can't do that anymore. I mean, we're not we're right. not as, like— willing anymore either to be uncomfortable in that in that thing and i think great point um you know in the outdoors community i think i love this community so much because a lot of the people are a little more gritty and yes. and even like hardcore campers and stuff i mean you spend a week in the woods and you're ready to go home and take a shower so yep. like we're just culturally and physically we've all we have ac now we have mm -hmm. the comforts of everything you could imagine you're basically when you go out in the woods we're bringing a full house with us essentially right. of, of right. you know a backpack on your back with a with a, a few nights of overnight equipment costs as much as a used car at this point in yes. time so it's not like we're out there <laughs> roughing it yeah these people <laughs> yeah. had a couple of pans and some 
some beef fat in their in a, in yeah. a tent basically and they're out there roughing it. So exactly. it is interesting. I never thought about that before. That's actually a really good point. Like yeah. We just don't do that anymore. There's nobody out there mm-hmm. like that. And right. yeah. And um, so let's kind of switch gears a little bit. What, sure. it, what of all the encounters, I mean, you talk to a lot of people, you talk to professionals in the field, you talk to people that just have stories, you do your own research. What's the most awesome or most um, incredible story that you've heard to date that you would be like, this just blows my mind? Hmm. That's a good question. I mean, you know, there there are a lot of stories that I've heard, um, you know, some of them more credible than others, some of them easier to believe than others. Mm-hmm. I think there are a lot of accounts where people see these creatures behaving like animals, like apes, you know, picking grass shoots and eating them and, you know, doing things like that. And then there are these wild encounters where these creatures are saving children and, you know, like hanging out with somebody in their backyard and the the woman's putting out food for them and they're just hanging out. Like it just, I don't know. It's, it's really hard to say because how, how do I know any of these stories are real? So I would say the one that really blows my mind and I know it's cliche to say is the Patterson Gimlin film. And the reason being is because there are so many elements that surround this story. There's the video, right? But it's not just the video. There are so many different pieces of evidence that back it up. Footprints were cast about nine days or so after the video was filmed. These footprints line up directly with the creature in the subject in the film. And then Roger Patterson, the time he rented the camera, you know, the the span of time that that went by before he actually captured the film, the location of the film, all of that comes into play to prove this creature's credibility. And I've heard other reports similar. One other report that I really like is the the Whitehall, New York encounter with law enforcement. I always find law enforcement stories very intriguing because these are people that are trained not to lie. These are people that are trained to have a very skeptical and, Uh, you know, tailored eye. They're looking intently for details and stuff. So I really tend to find those very credible. And in Whitehall, this police officer, uh, Brian Goslin, was after an encounter with some teenagers the night before, he was sitting in a field and he came face to face with this creature. And he, he put a spotlight on it. It raised its hand up. He saw its fingers and it screamed. And it, it, released such a power into him. He said it was like somebody was blowing a a trombone right in your face, you know, the amount of of power and energy that came toward him. And that really kind of blew my mind because this is somebody I felt I could trust. Mm -hmm. And he has told the story the same way, you know, every time he's told it to anyone. I've never met anyone that said, oh, he said this. And on the documentary, he said this. I mean, the story has remained the exact same. So I think that really blows my mind because of the credibility. I would say... In terms of shock value, I try not to get caught up in those stories because I try and focus more on the credibility and the details that follow the stories. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I to me to this day, there's only one that sticks out in my mind. I heard on Sasquatch Chronicles, and mm-hmm. that there's like what they're they're in like the seven hundreds of episodes now, so it's ridiculously yeah. long. I, I can't remember. I couldn't tell you what number it was, or even remotely yeah. in the ballpark. But the, fa- the one of my favorite ones is a guy and his buddy were camping somewhere in the mm-hmm. backwoods of somewhere in Canada on this lake, and this this they just heard something circling their tent all night, and the guy was just. He said he has never been so scared. I don't know why this one sticks out in my mind because I've listened mm-hmm. to like almost every single episode of that show, mm-hmm. like even the members ones and everything. So, I mean, it it was so weird because he said like this radio turned on. He was freaking out. It was just like this music blaring in the middle of the night because they left their tent and like went and sat oh on a God. on a uh, rock outcropping in like the lake and they were freaking out. And it, I don't know why. And he said like they they were. Like they felt trapped. Like, what can you do? This, whatever is around your tent is between you and the road. And then they're in the, they just kind of like went off into the woods because they're like backcountry guys. They're like, yeah, we found this. We took a left at this, at this trailhead and went off into the woods and found this lake. And I don't know. I, I always think to myself, like, what would you do? Cause I'm not, when I go out into the woods, I wouldn't say I'm ever like 
in fear of right anything like i'm usually mm-hmm. pretty chill and like i've i've backpacked so much and um you know now it's getting to the point where it's kind of like you get these little thoughts in the back of your head so when you go out personally Mm -hmm. do you ever kind of get that knot in your stomach or are you just kind of like I don't think anything's going to happen to me even if I do see one I mean that's the general trend of all of the reports I've ever heard like Mm -hmm. I don't think I've heard more than a handful that have been like I was physically assaulted by one of these things (laughs) so are you do you get nervous or are you kind of just like this I you just so do it so often and regularly involved that it's kind of like eh it's a little hairy, but whatever. I'm not worried about it. Um, I would say that um, I still get a little bit creeped out here and there. I think certain times, I mean, there's been one time when I was in the Whitehall area. I was on a really, really remote trail in the middle of nowhere around dusk. And I had a very bad feeling in the pit of my stomach to the point where I turned around and left. Um, but I like to travel in groups. I don't like to ever go out by myself. You know, I think... Um, you know, unfortunately, as a woman, I think there is a little bit higher of a risk, but there's a risk for everybody, too. There's a lot of weird people out there. So I always try and go with somebody else um, or more than than one person. And I like to have my bear spray ready and, you know, other things like that. Um, but I really it's it's tough to say. I mean, like I said, I I think I would probably be pretty terrified if I saw one. And I would love to see one, but I think it would really shake me up uh, because, you know, in your mind, you have kind of a database of what exists and what you know to be in the world. So if a bobcat walked by or a mountain lion, sure, you'd get that adrenaline rush, but you know they exist. You know they're out there. You've seen them on TV before. You've seen pictures of them. Whereas a Sasquatch, all we have to reference really is the Patterson-Gimlin film in terms of what they look like. So this is going to be something that just looks completely new to you and foreign. So I think anybody would be a little startled if they saw one. I try and Uh, I try and keep my ears and eyes open. You know, I I really try and listen to my surroundings, even if I don't feel threatened, because I want to have a good, uh, you know, standard constant of, you know, what the sounds in the woods are. What are the normal sounds in the woods? So that if I ever hear something that does sound off to me, at least kind of my senses will be heightened. Um, But again, I try and go with people that I feel comfortable with. Um, I just did a big expedition with Connor Anderson of the North American Bigfoot Center. And I felt so comfortable with him. You know, he was, he, I felt very safe, you know, and and I think it's really important to travel with somebody that you have confidence in. Um, But at the end of the day, if these creatures come across you and want to rip you to shreds, they can. So, you know, I don't think that that happens often. I think maybe it does. You know, you hear stories from Native Americans about them stealing their children, stealing their women, you know, vicious creatures, ripping people to shreds and killing them and cannibalists. I mean, a lot of these people call these creatures cannibals. Does that mean that they're eating people or does that mean they're eating each other? Who knows? But, you know, I don't think that they're these docile, warm and loving creatures that you're going to make friends with and invite over for dinner. I don't think that if it's an ape, look at how dangerous chimpanzees can be. I mean, they rip people's faces off. If they're more of a human, look at tribes in the Amazon. You know, they'll they'll arrow you to death, some of them. So, you know, I think you have to be really careful when you're out in the woods and you should not be taking this subject lightly. This is science. This is, you know, the discovery of a new species. And I think that you have to take caution when you're out in the woods. Personally, I worry more about the weird crazy, you know, drifters in the woods than I do about Bigfoot. Um, because I think in terms of their species, I think they just kind of want to be left alone and not bothered. But if I ever stumbled across a juvenile and a mother was, you know, a couple feet away and saw me near her kid, I probably would be dead. So it is a little bit scary and it is, it is a risk. And then, yeah. And I agree. There's a risk anytime you go out in the woods at all. I mean, Mm -hmm. I've had encounters with, uh, wildlife that have just scared the living crap out of me. Really? The the scariest thing that's ever happened to me was in Maine was, uh, (gasps) I came around a blind corner and, um, it was a a female moose. I mean, we're talking like I came around the corner and it was like, I almost ran into it. Like it was so close. And then I saw the baby and I was like, Oh shit, this is not (laughs) a good place to be. So I could imagine, and I don't remember feeling panicked. 
Mm-hmm. And, and I, I wonder, like, if 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 a similar situation happened with a, a Sasquatch, how how right. my body would react because I'm fairly comfortable in the woods. Right. Uh, I mean, I've run into bears. They've been outside my tent when I was sleeping. I've mm-hmm. I've run into the moose, like I just said. And I, it wasn't so much like that. You know, if you're if you're in a, like an example is if you're in a car, okay, save it, and you hit a slick spot, and you know how your heart jumps into your throat, and you're yes. like, yes. I didn't have that with the moose encounter. It was more of a, I stopped and I was like, I registered that it was not good. And huh. I, I I also registered, I'm not sure what to do right now. And I didn't take a picture. There's no pictures of this encounter because I was like, oh, hey, I might die. <laughs> right. Like imagine right. A, a multi-thousand pound animal in two feet from your face. Right. Um, and all I could think to do was to walk backwards and just make a big loop through the woods, mm-hmm. basically a- adjacent to the trail and head back on my way. Uh, so yeah, it, it is kind of one of those things like, what would you do? And and I had someone on a previous episode say, and I'd, I, I'm i interested in your opinion on this. Mm-hmm. He said, Hey, if you have, okay, say you're camping and you're sleeping and you wake up and hundred percent hear Bigfoot outside your tent, you hear the screams, you hear the wood knocking, whatever you hear leaves rustling. He said, the best thing you can do is if, if if not in your situation, you're a researcher, you're probably going to jump out and want to look. But if, if so he said the best thing you can do is just stay in your tent and just shut up and be there. He said mo- they're going to leave you alone. If yeah. they see you, they're going to be like, I don't want to be around this guy or whatever. So what's your thought on that? I to think the, that's to the average person out there. Sorry. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a, a really great piece of advice. I think it's important to just remain calm and act as if you would act with any other animal of the woods. Um, even if this creature is closer to human, they don't want any kind of confrontation. I don't think that's really their goal. I think that they just want to scare you away. They don't want you in the woods. I mean, imagine if, you know, imagine if you woke up one morning and there was a group of people sitting on your front lawn having a picnic. I mean, you would probably shout out your window, hey, get the hell off my lawn. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, you might start walking around and doing yard work, you know, to say, kind of hint at them, hey, I live here, you know, get off. Um, So I think that's kind of what they try and do. I don't think that they're trying to, you know, necessarily hunt you down and kill you. I think they're trying to intimidate you so you leave. So I think the best option would be if you have the option to leave, get in your car and leave. If you don't, just stay there. Try and be respectful of the creatures. You know, this is their habitat. This is their home. Um, and I think, you know, like he said, just just stay quiet. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I don't really necessarily know if you should behave the same way you would with a bear. With a bear, you may want to make noise to scare it away. I don't really know if that's a great idea with a Sasquatch. Um, I think it's important to look at the behavior of gorillas, chimpanzees. I think it's important to look at the behavior of indigenous um you know, people of, you know, that are living primitively. Uh, I think it's just important to look at all those factors because we're really not sure what Bigfoot is. You know, I mean, we are apes. We are mm-hmm. a form of ape. We just Correct. live in a very modern way. So I think it's important to look at primitive living people, how they would respond to an intruder in their tribe in their area and also to look at apes and see, you know, how great apes would respond and and maybe just you know, formulate and calculate your moves from there. Um, But going back to your point about being in the woods all the time, I know that, you know, you spend a lot of time in the woods and maybe you're surprised you haven't seen one. Honestly, I think it's only a matter of time. I think that a lot of the most credible reports I've ever received were from hunters that spend a lot of time outdoors, sit quietly, you know, don't make a lot of noise. And I think that although Sasquatch is highly intelligent, I think it is possible to sneak up on one. And I think it's possible for them to kind of come across you and and maybe not realize it. So I think, you know, just keep your eyes and ears open. I I think that you will definitely come across something, um, Eventually, if, if you plan on doing this the rest of your life. Yeah. And uh, so when you just mentioned that you had gone on an expedition with Connor, so how did that go? I mean, I know you guys both have kind of like uh, with the North American Bigfoot Center and then the Forest Floor, you kind of have like exclusive Patreon stuff. So a lot of people, you know, might be interested in seeing that whenever it comes out. You know, I'm not sure if it's out yet or not. So what mm-hmm. what kind of stuff were you guys doing and where were you? I would assume you probably went to Oregon or something. <laughs> Well, actually, we went to the Adirondacks. I really, oh, really? Yeah, oh. I really wanted him to see the Adirondacks. Um, and I said, you know, come on out. Let's let's 
let's do an expedition. Let's, let's try and see if, if you, I wanted to kind of know what he thought about the Adirondacks compared to Colorado and Oregon, where he's used to conducting his research. And I think he was surprised at how dense the forest is in New York. I don't think he expected that, even if he won't admit it. Um, (laughs) But I really wanted him to see the Adirondacks. And I wanted to bring his expertise into the field because I am new to field work. And prior to this expedition, I was conducting field work with people that weren't really into Sasquatch, you know, friends of mine that would come along and and Mm -hmm. things like that. Um, but to have somebody that is a seasoned researcher in the field with me was just, it just made a world of a difference. I mean, he taught me so many things and the, there are a few videos up on my Patreon right now, um, where Connor is explaining, you know, different techniques to use out in the field and, you know, what to look out for, which was really helpful to me. So the expedition overall went very well, but uh, we did go during tourist season in July. So I think, you know, it, I didn't I didn't really expect to find anything. I more wanted to look at the habitat and kind of see what area would be suitable for Sasquatch. And I had been doing research, you know, this entire year about what area was good, but I wanted to take him in the field with me and say, Hey, you know, what do you think of Whitehall opposed to Wells? Like, which one do you think, you know, there's more of a possibility of Sasquatch being. So it was really nice to get his take on everything. And he's coming back in September. We're going to go up to the Lake Placid region. And I know that there are a ton of reports that come out of there. And I'm hoping that the tourist season is dying down. So we may be able to get to some more remote trails and perhaps actually look for some evidence or an encounter this time. But I think, you know, when you're out in the field, you don't really want to expect to have an encounter because more than likely you're not going to. Um, But my new mission, and I am going to be uh, spending some time in Oregon. I'm going to go out there for a couple of months. Um, And my new mission while I'm in New York and while I'm in Oregon is to look for a possible nesting site. Um, I've been working a lot with Squatcher Metrics and PNW Bigfoot Maps and the Bigfoot Mapping Project. And they've been giving me a lot of data on sightings and, you know, kind of patterns on where these creatures may be. And again, you know, it's kind of hard to say because the the data is so like it's really not complete. Um, But I'm trying to go by what the Olympic Project is doing. You know, they're finding nests made of certain plants and woven in certain ways. And so I'm trying to think, you know, well, if there's nests out there and these, this is the same species, maybe there's some in New York. Mm -hmm. So I'm really trying to look out for that. I'm also looking out for a culture, right? Because, you know, if Bigfoot is close to human, which I believe that they are, then that means that they have time for creativity. They've done something to their environment to manipulate it, to suit them. Whatever that is, I'm not sure. That's kind of what I'm looking for. And I've kind of made this hypothesis, you know, Bigfoot is closer to human than ape. If Bigfoot is closer to human, that means it manipulates its environment to suit its needs. Now, I'm mainly going to be looking for evidence of that. If I can't find evidence of that, then they're probably closer to ape, which scares me because I'm really hardcore in the human camp. But um, I I have to be open to being proved wrong. And I want to see if I can find any evidence of culture that may not be similar to ours. You know, our culture is painting and music and all that type of stuff. But maybe their culture is making little things out of sticks. Maybe their culture is lining sticks up in a certain way on the ground or in a tree, Um, you know, rock formations or something like that. So I'm my new mission for my field work the next few months is to kind of Um, you know, look out for evidence of culture or, you know, a social environment within these creatures and kind of just explore their relationships and behavior a little bit more. And it's it's not going to be an easy task, but that'll be my next goal. So Connor is excited to help me. He's in the team ape camp. So we do have a lot of um, discussions about that. So he's kind of trying to prove me wrong. I'm trying to prove him wrong. Probably what will happen is we'll see a spaceship come down, drop off a couple of big butts, and we'll both say to each other, oh, my God, look, all these people that we doubted are right. So, you know, you always have to be open to to new theories in Bigfoot. And I think it'll be a, a really fun adventure. So I'm really excited for that. 
Awesome. Well, that sounds like a dang good time. You know, I can't wait to see the results of all that stuff. I mean, a few months, that's that's some hefty time to get some research in. And, and, yes. and at least if anything, in the end, you, you get to spend some time outdoors and in the right. Pacific Northwest. So right. you can't beat exactly. that. Exactly. Yes. Uh, and, and before we wrap up here, you know, mm-hmm. why don't you let people where, know where they can find you, uh, sure. how they can find your Patreon and any of your past research, podcast, all that fun stuff? Sure. So if anyone is interested in my research, they can just go straight to my website. It's theforestfleur.com. The forest, F-L-E-U-R. It's a little bit confusing for some people. But um, yeah, if if you go onto my website, I have uh, an evidence page for like Bigfoot beginners. You know, anyone who doesn't really know a lot about Bigfoot can go there and learn about the evidence that we have. Um, And then if you go to my research page, that's where all of my articles are. And I just started a new membership program. So I have exclusive podcasts. I have exclusive research articles. And then all of these mapping project pages have been helping me so much with my membership program. Um, a lot of my members are from you know Tennessee or Alabama. So PNW Bigfoots or Squatcher Metrics or the Bigfoot Mapping Project will put together uh, some data for me to share with my members, which has been so fabulous. I mean, the stuff that they've come up with is so interesting. Uh, I do a lot of different, you know, projects of my own. I did a project on road cross sightings to try and identify patterns. So that's up on my Patreon. And then in addition to all of those um, little extras, I have fieldwork vlogs. So I have videos of all of my fieldwork once a month for um, my um, higher tier members. And then for my lower tier I have, uh, you know, pictures and write-ups of my field work. So there's something for everybody. And, you know, uh, my members' donations are supporting my expeditions, which is so exciting. I mean, it's, it's so humbling to know that people are interested in what I'm doing enough to fund my expeditions and my projects. And it has just been such a humbling experience. And I'm so grateful for all of my members um, because they're allowing me to go out to Oregon and do this research. And I'll be spending a lot of time at the North American Bigfoot Center and, you know, going out and researching. So I am just, I am so excited. And I'm, my promise back to them is to just take them along with me. (laughs) Awesome. Well, I can't wait to see that personally. So, uh, Thank you for coming on the show. And, uh, you know, I can't wait to see what you guys come up with. I'm very excited. You know, Connor's an awesome guy. I've done a podcast Mm -hmm. with him and you guys are doing cool stuff. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It was great chatting. Hey, everybody. Thanks for watching this episode of the Aptitude Outdoors podcast here on YouTube. If you can, help me out. Go down below, hit that subscribe button. I'd greatly appreciate it. And uh, I really want to thank Emily for coming on and sharing all of her awesome stories and information about Bigfoot. So uh, it's really cool stuff and you know I'm glad it's Halloween time, one of my favorite times of the year and you guys seeing this shit? What the hell? Um, but anyway, you know, I want to thank Emily and if you can check out her website, theforestfloor.com. She's got great stuff there that you can buy. She's got great resources, she has her Patreon, all that stuff. And as always, I want to thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next week. Breaking news. Outdoorsman and host of the Aptitude Outdoors podcast, Paul Fuzinski, has gone missing. He was last seen heading into the woods with his camera last week, and currently his whereabouts are unknown. Search and rescue crews have called off their search after six long days of combing the forest. We will update you as any new information becomes available.